Through its worldwide resources, EWTN presents a global perspective of our Catholic faith. We welcome you to the Catholic Sphere. Hello, I'm Brian Patrick, and this week we're talking about one of the most amazing moments in the life of Christ and His Apostles, the Transfiguration of our Lord. Let's welcome our contributors. From Rome, we are blessed to have Father Mitch Pacwa, host of EWTN Live and a prolific author. I'm sure he's working on a new book. He always is. From EWTN Studios in Orange, California, we have with us James Day, the managing director there at EWTN in our West Coast. And for the first time, Maria Robles from the Philippines. Maria is an anchor and producer of Catholic Radio there with a, a great history in communication and a wonderful personal story. We're glad to have all three of you with us this week. Father Mitch, we'd like you to give us a biblical context for this experience of the Transfiguration, the short version, if you would. <laughs> sure. First of all, it's very important to note that our Lord had given his first prediction of his upcoming passion. He's on the way from the far north of the country where he had said to Peter, you are rocking on this rock, I'll build my church. And he's going from there down toward Jerusalem. And having just announced his upcoming suffering, passion, death, and burial and resurrection, he goes up with three of his closest disciples, witnesses to the raising of the daughter of Jairus and a couple, and the Agni Guard get, get seventy later, and with them goes on a mountain, and while he's praying and they're sleeping, he is transformed, or as we say transfigured. The light shines from within him outward. It's not a light that comes to him. He's a source that transforms his clothes and looks like lightning is one of the expressions that St. Luke uses. And he speaks to two representatives of the law, Moses, and the prophets, Elijah. And with Elijah and Moses, he is speaking about his exodus. That's the word St. Luke uses. Hmm. By that, he means his suffering, death, and resurrection. So, Father, I know that when you've been to Mount Tabor. Let's talk a little bit about Mount Tabor. It's not really mentioned in yeah. Scripture. How do we know that this is the mountain that Jesus brought his disciples up for this amazing event? Sure. We know this from the early church tradition. There were chapels built there by the second century, fourth century, during the Crusades and uh, in the uh, Renaissance period, Renaissance, post-Renaissance, and then in the um, modern time. So there's a continuity of churches on that spot to mark it, and it's recognized by both Orthodox and Catholics. Okay, and we, in a moment, we're going to talk about that exact spot that you've been to, but I do want to talk a little bit about sacred art with James Day out in California. James, there are many beautiful art depictions of the Transfiguration. Tell us about the one that really speaks to you. The one that really speaks to me, Brian, is Raphael's Transfiguration which is housed in the Vatican Museums. There's a copy of it in St. Peter's Basilica. And when I was in college, I had the opportunity to meditate before uh, that copy of Raphael's Transfiguration. Uh, when I was uh, on a trip there, there was a se seminarian next to me who read the uh, particular gospel passage before that painting. So it, uh, it, it put together, again, uh, one of my interests is, is using art and faith, and, and that really uh, spoke to me. Historically, what's really interesting about that particular painting is that when Napoleon marched on Rome, uh, that painting, among with about a hundred others, were seized from the Vatican, from Rome, taken to the Louvre, which had just opened for public viewing uh, as, a, as an art museum, and it was housed there. And then when Napoleon finally fell, and the popes outlived him, uh, the art returned. And, uh, and so, so Raphael's Transfiguration, which was painted in 1520, uh, remains to this day uh, in, in the Vatican. It's a beautiful piece of art. Thank you for opening that up to us. 
Maria, let's talk about the events of the Transfiguration and how you relate them to what's going on in our world today, just coming off this COVID pandemic. Well, the Philippines being a developing country is experiencing a lot of challenges in facing this global health crisis. We have uh, overworked and overwhelmed health workers. Our health system is so burdened because we have a problem of lack of resources and uh, the government structures were not really prepared. But it is a reality that we have to face and everybody is, is trying to, to help one another. The government, of course, is leading, the public sector is helping, even the church, many organizations are helping out to uh, ease the problem of uh, the pandemic here in the Philippines. But the real challenge is really to get away from the, from the harsh realities. I know it's difficult, but we have to do it because there's something else waiting for us. We can't be downtrodden and just be concerned about what's going on and forget about uh, God's promise. There is uh, another destiny for us. There's glory. There's something divine that we should be looking at beyond the, the, the problem. Uh, it's, it's, it's rather difficult, I know, because there's poverty, there's uh, the, the slow vaccination process, the herd immunity is, is not going to happen very soon. But the challenge for us, the Catholic faithful Christians all over the world, is to try and look beyond the situation and continue to hope. Yeah, some light in the darkness. And I know you have some very personal experiences with seeing that light, that illumination from our Lord through your own health challenges. We'll talk about that a little bit later on as well. Coming up, our own transforming transfiguration experiences as the Catholic Sphere continues on EWTN, the Global Catholic Network. Catholic Sphere, EWTN's weekly global perspective of our Catholic faith. It's good to have you with us. I'm Brian Patrick. Maria Robles joins us from the Philippines. James Day in Southern California and Father Mitch Pacwa is in Rome this week joining us here on the Catholic Sphere. So Maria, if you would start out with some personal thoughts, I, I just want to share something a little personal to me about this transfiguration experience. I love the fact that Peter says to our Lord, Lord, it is good for us to be here. I like to focus on that when I'm in adoration or right after receiving the Eucharist. Lord, it is good for us to be here with you. So many forms we are transfigured uh, in our presence, in our connection with our Lord. Maria, how do you find that that's changed your life, it, the face of the Lord being in such close contact with this transfigured Jesus? In my case, Brian, as you mentioned earlier, I have had a, a difficult health challenge because uh, as if COVID-19 was not enough, I had my second bout of cancer this year. And uh, that would have discouraged me, but uh, I take refuge in, in the fact that we have a God who loves and understands us. So the transfiguration for me in this case is an invitation for another encounter. This is my second cancer in eight years. It's another opportunity to deepen my faith, grow in self-knowledge, and maybe open myself up for a new challenge. Maybe the Lord has new marching orders for me. Mm. And I would like to, to look beyond uh, just what's happening around me and, and try to look, look far, look to God, if you will, for a message, for uh, a divine direction that will guide me from here on. 
And in the meantime, even in your treatment, you're coming in contact with people that you could minister to in terms of how you are dealing with your cancer and people you probably wouldn't have met otherwise if you weren't going through that treatment yourself. I had a dear friend, Father Jim Willig, who had kidney cancer, and he talked about how he would minister to others during the hours of chemotherapy that they would endure for their cancer. So God brings out the good, even in these very difficult challenges. Father Mitch, I'm really curious about Mount Tabor. I know you've been to the Holy Land, you've traveled there. Tell us about that experience and some of your encounters there. Yeah, it's a, a very beautiful place. It's a mountain that stands pretty much by itself. It's not connected to other mountains in the midst of the Jezreel Plain. So you get a good view around you. And it's a very distinctive mountain. And there's a church built there that was based on the meditations on the gospel. The central nave is dedicated to Christ. Under each tower, each of which is shorter than the nave, there is a chapel, one to Moses, one to Elijah. And the architect had a sense that we would look to, to the goal of Peter. Let's build a tent for mm -hmm. you, for Moses, and for Elijah. And the architect did it that way. So the roof of each part looks like a tent but the one of Christ is larger and taller. And, of course, Moses and Elijah are considered saints. They have feast days in the church calendar, but lo local calendar. Yeah. And to see that connection between the prediction of Christ's coming in Moses and the law and Elijah and the other prophets, and Christ fulfilling that, but also still looking forward toward his death and resurrection. And relating that, that church brings those elements out. Yeah, and I, I mentioned at the top of the, the segment that Peter said, Lord, it's good that we are here. Peter was a very practical guy. He meant, it's good we're here to build these tents, <laughs> but it was much deeper, that, uh, you know, that connection of them actually being there. And James, I want to talk a little bit about this illumination. Scripture tells us in Matthew's gospel that, that he sh his, his face shone like the sun and his, his skin, or rather his clothes were as white as light. How is this illumination so central to our own faith. You know, I really looked at the transfiguration in a, in a new light, uh, if you will, when I uh, really started to meditate on the devotions to the holy face uh, and how, uh, you know, for, for instance, there's folks who subscribe to the authenticity of the turn shroud um, and those who say, uh, scientists even say, that the uh, image was formed at the moment of the resurrection. Uh, you know, I don't want to get too into the weeds in that, but the point is, is that the light to them uh, burst outward, inward from Christ onto the sheet in a way that, that reflects a lot of the transfiguration, this idea of resurrection light, the divine presence of, of God. Uh, beyond that, in my own research, uh, in my hunt to drill down for, for the truth of, of that particular cloth, I noticed that there was a doctrine from the Orthodox Church in the 14th century called the, uh, the Hesychasm uh, Doctrine, the Hesychasm Controversy, which is, uh, also means the uncreated light of God, that one can, can become so uh, in, imbued in, in meditation that they themselves can take on uh, this uncreated light uh, that we, that we saw, saw in the Transfiguration. I'm, I'm being very, very general here. Uh, the Catholic Church hasn't said one way or the other if this is a, an approved controversy, but John Paul II spoke about it in 1996 as a way of bridging uh, the two faiths. Um, and, and specifically, we see this illumination in the luminous mysteries that John Paul II promulgated, particularly with the Transfiguration as one of those luminous mysteries. So bottom line is that there is something to be said about the transcendence of the divine presence that we see in the transfiguration as, as part of this resurrection faith. Thanks for mentioning the luminous mysteries. Father Mitch, back to you very briefly to make a connection between the luminous mysteries and the joyful mysteries in the things that were actually said on Mount Tabor and also at the wedding feast of Cana. Yeah, Our Lady had said at 
Cana in John chapter 2, verse 5, do whatever he tells you. She said that to the servants. Now, here in this fourth of the luminous mysteries, at the transfiguration, the Father speaks and says, this is my beloved Son, listen to him. So we have his father and his mother both telling us to do what he says. And that is an imperative for us to pick up the words of the gospel, read them, meditate on them, but then act on them. So Absolutely. That not mere hearers of the word, but doers. Listen to him and then do whatever he tells you. I think we can't go wrong if we follow that map. Coming up, we'll discuss one of Rome's great basilicas and the significance of a Marian icon housed there, plus our spiritual challenges for the week as the Catholic sphere continues here on EWTN. Thank you for joining us for The Catholic Sphere on EWTN. I'm Brian Patrick. It's great to have Father Mitch Paqua joining us this week from Rome. We have James Day from Southern California and Maria Robles in the Philippines. So, Father, you're there in Rome. Let's talk about this week's celebration of the dedication of St. Mary Major. Tell us about this beautiful basilica and the significance of it. Yeah. It's one of the four major basilicas in the city of Rome, and it is dedicated to the Blessed Mother. And that dedication took place because of the Council of Ephesus. At that council, of the, the Ecumenical Council of the Church, the doctrine of uh, Nestorius was condemned. He denied that we could call the Blessed Virgin Mary the Theotokos, the one who bore God or the Mother of God. The reason for that was he did not accept Christ's divine personhood. This, and that's what this is about, that the doctrine of Mary as the mother of God is a, the doctrine that says the one she bore is God and she is truly his mother. His person is a divine person and he has two natures, a human and a divine nature, but one divine person. And because the, a mother relates to a person and gives birth to a person, not to a nature. Mm. The emphasis of the doctrine is that she's the mother of God to bring out his divine person. It does not mean she's divine. Well, when that was decreed at a church dedicated to the Blessed Mother in the city of Ephesus, then in Rome, it was accepted, promulgated, and the Church of St. Mary Major was built. And it is a beautiful church. And James, isn't this where Pope Francis visits a particular icon of the Blessed Mother before and sometimes after his travels? That's right. It's the icon the, called the Salus Populi Romani. It's uh, also known as uh, the protectress of the Roman people or the health of the Roman people, which is actually a very important phrase. Uh, Pope Francis made it a, a tradition to, as you said, to, to visit this icon before and after each international trip. Uh, and uh, like, for example, when he came back from Iraq, he uh, brought flowers from, from Iraq and, and put, that at the, put that at the icon. Uh, that icon, uh, traditionally hold, tradition holds that St. Luke actually created that icon as part of his icon painting uh, collection, if you will. It was brought from Ephesus to Rome at the end of the 6th century. Um, Gregory, the, during a time of plague, Gregory the Great uh, supposed to walked around in procession with that icon before seeing the vision of St. Michael at top of Castle San Angelo, which ended that plague. It's interesting, uh, during that famous, in, instantly famous Urbi et Orbi, uh, during the, right at the start of the pandemic, when Pope Francis is holding that Urbi et Orbi before an empty St. Peter's, if we remember, he had the icon there. And so it connects the health of the Roman people, just as that icon helped end the plague of 590 AD, here Pope Francis is using it again to help us get through this current pandemic. So it's there, it's been there for a long time and uh, it seems to have never failed. 
And Pope Francis has recently gone through some health issues of his own. And uh, after his recovery, plans to make a trip to your homeland, Maria. Can you tell us about any of the preparations or plans for this upcoming papal visit? I don't have much information about that, but uh, I'm sure that as soon as announcements are made, it will be made public. But we are very much uh, excited about this, and I'm sure that it's going to be a very momentous event for the Philippines, especially that we are in the middle of our celebration of our 500th year anniversary of the arrival of Christianity here. Well, certainly, you know, when the Pope visits any country, there are large crowds, but nothing like the Philippines. I believe Pope Francis has been there before. I'm sure John Paul II visited the Philippines. Describe that massive crowd that gathers because Phil the Philippines are such a Catholic country. I heard that uh, we broke many records as far as uh, papal visits are concerned. And uh, this are, are always historic events and well documented. Uh, that's why the, the popes, our holy fathers, are very, very close to the hearts of many Filipinos. And even to this day, there are many memories, very fond memories and recollections of Filipinos having special encounters uh, with the Holy Fathers that visited the Philippines. So, Father Mitch, on the subject of travel, you are obviously traveling now there in Rome. I wonder what brings you to Rome this time. I'm doing some interviews. Uh, I've interviewed the Grand Master of the Knights of the Holy Sepulchre yesterday, uh, did another interview here yesterday. Um, and then the main task is to do a documentary on the uh, Vatican Apostolic Archives. They used to be called the Secret Archives. Uh, we explain why it's not secret the way silly people writing dumb novels have it. It means personal, private archives, that's all. And the Pope changed it to apostolic because it belongs to the whole church and it's part of the church's mission. And uh, it really went well. Tell us a little bit about your experience visiting a very ancient cemetery. Yeah, yeah one of the things that uh, you also do in Italy, people like to see the Colosseum and all that. But today, I went over to the Etruscan uh, burial sites and to see this earlier culture that was far more advanced than the Roman culture, but was eventually defeated by the Roman culture. Uh, it, was, it was fascinating. And it's good for folks to know that the history of Italy in this region is quite complicated and, and fascinating. So I got a chance to visit some of those enormous cemeteries. So it's, it's a town, but for the dead. Yeah. And uh, they, they've uncovered a good deal of it. So you understand a little bit more of Italian history better. What an experience. Just before our weekly challenges, James, can you draw a connection between your patron, St. James, and our Blessed Mother, who he actually saw probably in the very first apparition of Our, our, our Lady? It's considered maybe the first apparition of, of Our Lady, but she was still alive. This is uh, circa 40 A.D., and uh, St. James is in Spain, and he's uh, paving the way, the, the pilgrim way, uh, for the faith there in that region. Uh, we know now he succeeded given the Santiago de Compostela and how popular that is. Uh, but when he was down and out and, and uh, really questioning uh, his vocation at that time, Our Lady uh, appeared to him. Uh, the, our, the pillar, uh, Our Lady of the Pillar is also uh, another name uh, for her uh, in this particular apparition. And uh, sure enough, uh, you know, he uh, he ended up being becoming martyred three years later as the first uh, uh, one of the first apostles to be martyred. And so many people make that trek on that 500 uh, Cam 500 mile Camino, the, known as the way to the Cathedral Basilica, rather of Santiago. Each week here on the Catholic Sphere, we offer a personal challenge. Mine is to spend some time with our Lord in the Blessed Sacrament, and if you would use that simple prayer from Saint Peter, Lord, it is good to be here. Maria, what's your challenge? Well, to keep on uh, looking 
to the Lord for a new challenge at this part of my life and to be more united with those who are suffering, other cancer patients, those suffering uh, because of COVID-19. Okay, thank you, Maria. And James, yours? Yeah, I would uh, encourage people to uh, consider living in the light of the resurrection faith, uh, the transfigured faith of the divine presence, the resurrection of God. And I would also mention uh, a simple prayer uh, to consider. It's Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Absolutely. And Father Mitch. As our Lord met with Elijah and Moses on the mountain and discussed his upcoming death, I'd like people to enter into the Old Testament in light of the New Testament and let Jesus shed light on the, New the Old Testament for them, but also let the Old Testament shed light on Jesus as happened at the Transfiguration. Father Mitch Pacwa in Rome, James Day in Southern California, Maria Robles in the Philippines. Thank you, all three of you, for joining us. And thank you for our team here at EWTN's The Catholic Sphere. I'm Brian Patrick. Thank you for joining us. And please join us again next week for The Catholic Sphere here on EWTN.